get our legends. I hope that you're having a fantastic day. And I promise that this video is going to be a bit shorter because this sickness has really got me. But right at the beginning, we're going to look at some maps. We're going to look at some geolocated footage and some strikes. We're going to talk about the International Criminal Courts, this mix-up with Israel and Hamas as well. We need to talk about F-16s and other fighter aircraft and airfields as well. Now, the first thing I want to speak about is this strike in Odessa. So we'll have a look on the map of where Odessa is right down in here. I believe one of, if not the most important area for this war. It would be absolutely change the entire horizon of this war if Russia was able to seize ground in here for economic as well as military points. And we do know Russia has had a lot of strikes into here of recent. Now, one of which has badly damaged or destroyed this beautiful building here. People call the Hogwarts Castle. Now, again, with all of these strikes, the information, campaigns, everything goes just ballistic of what it was. And due to every side being called out before, there's just no trust in believing what is what anymore. So, of course, one side will say that this was a terror attack against a residential building. The other side will say either it was housing military and or it was air defence that then went into this building here both of which we have seen examples of before. Either way, this building has been badly damaged and or destroyed, and we do know that there are a number of people killed in this, including civilians. So again, it's never a good thing. But let's just have a look at the maps straight off the bat as there is some interesting and large changes relative. So this is Ukraine center, the capital of Kyiv. The red areas occupied since 22 and the purple since 2014. Green on this map indicating territory where Russia has been and Ukraine has either pushed them out or Russia has withdrawn and blue being that same, but within two weeks. So where I want to come down first is this island in the Kherson region. Now, what we can see on the MOD map is this control has then been taken back to grey zone for the majority of this. Now, as well, I was waiting on seeing maybe some geolocated footage, some flag, some flag planting in here. We haven't actually seen anything yet to confirm this movement, but we do know multiple sources from different sides of the aisle are reporting on this, but we have seen a decrease in control there. We're seeing no change in Robotny, but then we'll come, let's actually go into Avdivka first as this is the most crucial changes. So we'll bring up this so we can see the movements of today. And as you can see, large movements here of Russia expanding their control around Osharetne and Novokolnovi and Keramik as well, closing up this gap between these two. Now, we spoke about the other day that likely there was already a withdrawal of soldiers from here. Otherwise, there would be potential for getting uh, surrounded. And we know that that has happened in other areas and rumors that it had, has been happening in this area as well. But these are large changes as Russia does move down both the train line and this major road here. Of course, this road leads all the way to Pokrovsk and is a major hub for movement of goods and logistics in and out of this area. As we've spoken about, if there is a push further down into here, the ability to then have a southerly or northerly push and bypass some defensive works is possible. That could be what he's being seek to do here, other than moving through the open ground in these areas out from Semenivka. But these are major changes and major expanses of this front line. So let's have a look on Surak and see where this is lining up or not. Now, again, showing incredibly similar of this movement out to the northeast, as well as this movement and closing up around the Keramik front. So situation north of Divka, Russian army made significant advances west and northwest of Ochoretne in the direction of the railway and this less than a kilometre from this locality. On the other hand, map corrections were made at the eastern part of Ochoretne where Ukrainian army still has presence over the garages and some higher buildings at the micro district of the locality. So just in here, so just right in this area here that it has had a correction saying that we know now Ukraine is still there. South of it, Russian and Ukrainian forces are clashing at the trench line west of Solivov, uh, while far northwest Russian troops manage 
to fight to full control the southern part of Kedemik and captured the high position that overlooks Navakolnovi, which is now under full Russian control. The big Ukrainian trend system at the center is surrounded from three sides now. So systems in here. So it will be interesting to see what this looks like tomorrow, at least over the next couple of days. And we could see that this then close up here. Would this prove this idea that this is going to get cut off very quickly for the ground lines of communications, not being able to provide then logistics out into this front because of the expansion of this. That said, everything can move very quickly on these maps. So hold off, don't count your chickens before they hatch. But that is interesting to look at what is happening here. Now we'll just move down to the south, Krasnodar and Hoofka. This area is just where we know this map is just not keeping up. That the deep state MOD map here it's just not showing what we know to be in here. We know there is Russian presence in here. We know that there is Russian armoured movements into here. But it does show this control out into the east of an expansion of control by the Russians as well today. Of course, these areas are important because this is since 2014. There are trench systems and defensive works being lost here that have been held now for over a decade. So we will look at some footage here as well. So... This is the map update we have from Suryak today. Now, no major changes on his map, but what it does show is this movement here near the industrial zone. But see this red line? This is showing where, and we'll watch the video in a second, where these house tanks, bleat mobiles, whatever you want to call them, have moved in and out of Krasnohivka. Now, these have had incredible success. Call them dumb, whatever you want to call them. Either way, we do know that these are being successful, both moving dropping off troops and moving back out of these heavily mined, heavily defended and heavily uh, artilleried areas at the front line. So situation west of Donetsk City, recent video footage shows new Russian tank attack inside Krasnodarivka. Tanks reached the limits of the refractory plant, so the plant in here, and landed troops there later retreating to the original positions. The streets of here and here are completely taken and the result of the industrial area from this axis begun. So now there'll be a assault on this region so let's have a look at this footage here and i'll bring this map up on the side so you can see where this is then moving so you can just see the amount of fire and artillery towards these as well as firing from the vehicles themselves this is the industrial area that we're looking uh, at there you can see the tanks firing So, as well, artillery coming back at and targeting as these vehicles move through. We're just going to skip forward just a little bit here as we can see how heavy the bombardment becomes. And you can also talk about the success of these vehicles. Yes, it may look stupid, but at the end of the day, if it's working, it is working. We know that these have the shell over them packed full of things like electronic warfare equipment and it provides just some extra security from charges. So moving through, and then we can see out into this built-up then industrial zone. With the vehicles, it's hard to see with just the amount of smoke and dust in the air, but it is in this industrial zone. You can see this smoke stack uh, just here. You'll see it on the right. Give me one second, right there. So if we go back to here, this is this location here to give you an idea. And then you can see these vehicles have, it's said to have conducted a drop-off of Russian troops to continue the assault into here and would be dropping logistical supply as well. And then you can see these vehicles then moving back out of Krasnohrivka as well. So again, you can't underestimate the success these are actually then having. Yes, likely some were destroyed in this, but at a war like this, you're going to have losses, and this is a tactic that is obviously working, and we're seeing these vehicles turn up on other front lines as well, and it is having success on this front. So that is very interesting to see what is happening here. Now, we're just going to move out to the north, actually, to look at another change on this map. There's no changes in Bakhmut shown on this map, but I believe, yes, we do have one then. 
of for Suriak and Shasiv Yar here. Now, Shasiv Yar is incredibly important as if this was captured and the high ground here could open up into Konstantinivka and Kramatorsk and, of course, support down to the south, this taking of this Toretsk front line, of course, where we're seeing this Ochotetni advancement. But this will be an incredibly critical area. Russia has had some failures here. Situation on the east of Shasivya. After three weeks of combats, Russian army failed to consolidate control of the first houses of Canal Markadusikt, where were uh, which were retaken by Ukrainian army. So have been pushed out of. If we have a look just in this district here. No change shown on the MOD map because they never showed that anything was taken there. But we come up into the northeast of the country now. Different, like I know Bill, the German um, news was saying as well that there is a massing of twenty to 40,000 Russian troops up in this area for a Kharkiv advancement up in the north of the country. But we do see that there is more ground now made down at Kislivka, and this is now for at least three or four days in a row. We have this Russian advancement out through Kislivka. As well, Surak's not showing this advancement here, but he did show one yesterday, and he did show more now down near Tabayevka, but this isn't being shown on this map as well. But this area, I think, is somewhere to absolutely keep your eye on. Ukraine obviously think the same because they're putting a lot of assets and a lot of troops up into this area, and as well, over the past couple of weeks, has been evacuating civilians from frontline areas in the Kharkiv Oblast as well. Now, what we will just look at while we're actually up here is a new airfield that is being built up in here. So let's have a zoom back out so we can see this is in the Belgorod Oblast. Of course, this is Kharkiv. This is Sumy, that there is a new airfield being built here. Now, what we need to look at is this is just at this time when the photograph was taken, just an open bloody field, which now... It is looking like this. You can see that this is being built up here. This was on, I believe, March the 5th that this photograph was taken. Now, people have pointed out that this was a civilian infrastructure airport being built, but others have pointed out, yeah, do you really think that if the Russian military didn't need to use it, then they couldn't then overtake and use it? And people have also pointed out by taking the size of this, I've said that this is 1,800 metres long. You don't make airports that long for bloody Cessnas and whatever. This could accommodate your large Eagle 76 type planes. And could this all line up into what we get, what we potentially may see that North Group push into the Kharkiv and Sumy? Or, or is all of this a bit of a ruse to draw troops away from where Russia is having success and Ukraine is already having manpower issues? I don't know. I'll let that up to you guys to decide. But we have one more map update for you down in the Orokiv front here in Robotnik. Now, there are different footages coming out, different maps showing so many changes down in here, but let's just have a look at this today. Situations up front. Russian army made new advances west of Robotny, taking control over a series of trenches and new parts of the locality and now controls half it. As a result, Ukraine army retreated from the most of its positions inside Robotny. So if we look at where this road is running, see where it turns down to the west, northwest here, that it is saying that there is advancement all the way up into here of the Russian forces. Again, the maps just show so different in here. I don't know what to believe. I've seen some geolocated footage that people doubted, saying this was older footage here. Again, eventually we will know exactly what is happening here, but just for now, take take it with a grain of salt. Now, I want to talk about F-16s. Now, we do know that Ukraine is desperately waiting for F-16s to come into the country, and me, as well as a lot of others, I think that these have actually been built up too much for the change of that I think the F-16s will have, I think it potentially is not going to be where they're built up to be. But I guess then we will see. So let's have a look at this. Now, this is AI voiced, well, this, but talking about where these F-16s will be placed in Ukraine. And this is going to be a problem. We're seeing Russia have a lot more success with these uh, long-range missile attacks. And where are these planes actually going to go? It's very difficult to hide a two kilometer runway for this it is necessary to properly prepare the place of their base their location since these are colossal funds if we are talking for example about the excavation of various underground hiding places bunk so talking about digging bunkers that it would be incredibly expensive this also takes time therefore other various methods are currently being developed as to exactly how it will be possible to place it where it will be possible to place it 
Of course, we understand that it will be a scattered use on different types of airstrips, airfields, where it will be difficult to detect the enemy. Exactly. For this, a different set of methods will be used in order to mislead the enemy and at the same time to use them effectively. I would not like to broadcast now exactly how this will be done. However, of course, there is already a certain number of studies, thoughts, how it will be possible to safely place 16 aircraft in Ukraine so that they can quickly perform their tasks and protect our airspace. So, interestingly, they're saying 16, but also saying that these are going to be scattered across different runways. And I'm sure that Russian satellites are, and Chinese satellites, we know China, China are providing a lot of uh, that imagery to Russia as well, are looking for what airstrips are being built up being reinforced or new pavement put down. But we need to look at this as well because this is coming out from Business Insider, speaking that the US has purchased 81 Soviet-era planes from Kazakhstan. Of course, historic ally of Russia, Kazakhstan, was in the Soviet Union. Now, these planes can be used for spare parts or as decoys in conflict regions, the Kiev Post reported. And I believe most likely that these planes will not be airworthy just for the price that they were sold at and most likely will be used as either target practice for the US or uh, Ukraine, like on the ground, or as they say, their decoys. Kazakhstan, which is upgrading its air fleet, auctioned off 117 Soviet Euro fighter bomber aircraft, including MiG-31, MiG-27, MiG-29, Su-24 from 70s and 80s for a uh, cost of a billion Kazakhstani tens for 2.2 million USD, each plane $20,000. So anything of worth, I'm guessing, will be absolutely stripped out of one of those. For 20 grand, bloody, we could put some money together between us all and just fuck around sitting in it and playing out our bloody Top Gun uh, fantasies. Anyway, that is likely, I think, what those are going to be used for. Where these fighters are going to go, well, we know that up near Dnipro, there has been strikes successfully against Ukrainian MiG-29s against the airfield there, maybe out in the west, but then it limits their use a lot for time and fuel everything out into the country. So we are unsure of this, but we do have some interesting footage here that I haven't seen before. I've said to be a Russian X-101 cruise missile here. Of course, these are subsonic being chased by a Ukrainian air to air missile. We can hear the sonic boom. That is it there. Whether that caught up or not, we are unsure of what happened there, but a very interesting footage to have a look at. So just yesterday, I spoke about the United Nations and the ICC, and I mentioned that in some areas where they want to charge, they just don't have any jurisdiction. Of course, they don't have their own police or military, so they can't really do anything, nor do they have really the balls to go against the US and you know its allies. Well, today, some of this is coming out and is causing a massive stir. So diplomats from the G7 industrialized nations have urged officials at the ICC not to announce war crimes charges against Israel or Hamas officials amid concerns that such a mood could disrupt the chances of a breakthrough in ceasefire talk. Something I will mention is the ICC did issue arrest warrants for Putin and Maria Belovo, Maria Belova uh, as well. But Asked about the prospects of ICC warrants, White House spokesman um, Carrie Anne Jean Pierre has said, We've been really clear about the ICC investigation. We don't support it. We don't believe that they have the jurisdiction. So, undermining here, if you don't have the jurisdiction, well, how does that apply one and not the other? US politicians spoke out with Republican uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mike Johnson, saying such a lawless action by the ICC would directly undermine US national security interests. If unchallenged by the Biden administration, the ICC could create and assume unprecedented power to issue arrest warrants against American political leaders, American diplomats, and American military personnel, thereby endangering our country's sovereign authority. Democratic Senator John Fetterman warned it would be a fatal blow to the judicial and moral center of the ICC to pursue this path against Israel. So I applied one area, not others. And this is my take of all these laws of war, laws of armed conflict, warrants, whatever, is if the UN is going to be what the UN was originally set up for, as well as the ICC, investigations or arrests or charges or whatever, they can't be pick and choose 
when you want or when you don't want, depending on the powerful nation or your jurisdiction. And I think this is just further proving that it's either going to, if they do do this, it's going to undermine the whole system because the US and Israel and other countries are going to go, whatever. And in turn, that will undermine the legitimacy of any warrants put out or charges against, say, Russian officials, which Ozint Defender speaks about here. Now, you can say as well, which countries recognize this? And you can see America, Russia, say Ukraine, and as well, Israel have signed, but not yet have ratified, where Australia and Canada, whatever, have signed and ratified. But he says here, Regarding the New York Times article that I posted earlier, I guarantee if the ICC does, uh, does decide to issue an arrest warrant for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other Israeli officials, it will cause some major issues for the organisation and most countries in Europe, as well as the US and countries linked to the US, will not consider the warrant as valid. This is one of the worst ideas the ICC could ever have and would likely backfire terrible, terribly, making countries and individual, individuals possibly question their other warrants for actual war criminals like Vladimir Putin. It also makes you really think why leaders like Bashar al-Assad or Kim Jong-un haven't had arrest warrants issued for them. So very interesting here. We've spoken about the UN, the ICC, and what legitimacy as well as actual jurisdiction Legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day. Sorry, this one was whatever. I'm just, I'm not well. <laughs> Look after yourselves. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.